Hello, I'm Jake Holmes. Welcome to the American Arts Project. In our last issue, David Dubal began a conversation with noted American composer and critic Virgil Thompson. David Dubal is a pianist and musical director of New York classical music station WNCN. Beyond being familiar with Virgil Thompson's compositions and writings, Dubal has become a close friend of the composer. So much so, in fact, that recently Virgil Thompson created one of his musical portraits with Dubal as the subject. That is, sketching the sitter using the colors of the orchestra. We'll hear that portrait performed by the Oshkosh Symphony later. But first, David Dubal reads from Virgil Thompson's personal statement. I was born in Kansas City, Missouri, grew up out there, and went to war from there. That was the other war. Then I was educated some more in Boston and Paris. In composition, I was chiefly the pupil of Nadia Boulanger. While I was still young, I taught music at Harvard and played the organ at King's Chapel, Boston. Then I returned to Paris and lived there for many years, until after the Germans came, in fact. From 1940 through 1954, I was music critic of the New York Herald Tribune. I still live in New York. In the first part of this conversation, Virgil Thompson discussed his childhood, education, years in Paris, and his operatic collaborations with Gertrude Stein. The 87-year-old Thompson has been exceedingly prolific, and that leaves lots more musical territory to cover. We begin with David Dubal. We have talked about Virgil Thompson, the composer of opera, but we haven't talked about Virgil Thompson, the composer of a whole mountain of music in other forms. When did you write a work that I am and always have loved, the Hymn Tune Symphony? I wrote the Hymn Tune Symphony in France in the winter of get a performance by Kuzovitsky in America? No. He was very interested in me because I'd helped him get a job in Boston, uh, but he was afraid to perform it. Uh, it actually didn't get uh, performed oh, for nearly 20 years. His first performance was in 1945 at the Philharmonic, with myself conducting, actually must have disappointed you to wait 20 years for this. Uh, well, you have to wait for th things if they don't take place. You've always been patient. I don't know whether I'm patient or not, but you've got to wait anyway. People want to have children, and their children, they don't get children. They have to wait. So in a sense, you know, Virgil, that your hymn tune symphony was one of the first American scores in the symphonic uh, form. Then, in the 30s, you also wrote one of the first important ballet scores. Filling Station was in 1937, I wrote. It was the uh, first ballet 
score by, well, the first successful one by my generation. Uh, actually, Aaron Copeland had written a ballet for Ruth Page in Chicago several years before, and it didn't work very well. Uh, but I wrote this ballet for Lincoln Kerstage troupe uh, in 37. Aaron wrote a very successful one the next year called uh, Billy the Kid. Yes. And after that, the American ballet took off. Uh, but you see, by this time, there was this company which really did serious and excellent work and could handle musical and other novelties. Well, we have seen you writing the hymn tune symphony in the uh, middle 20s, the filling station in the uh, middle 30s, and when came the first of the important film scores? 36, that was the plow. Plow that broke the plains. And the, and the river was 37. story was 47. Is that when you won the Pulitzer Prize? Yeah. For the Louisiana story? Yeah. Did it come naturally to you to create musical sounds that gave picture to the American landscape? Pictures of any landscape. Unless it's natural to you, you can't do anything. You have to have some skills, but you, <laughs> you have to kind of take to it. And I've always taken to stage music. Documentaries, of course, are likely to use not actors, but real people who are not actors. And that I find more interesting than trying to make a background for uh, a big name. I did one picture that, that on a fiction film called The Goddess. It won, it's a good film. It won a prize at various European places. But it's the only fiction film I've ever done. I've done about nine or ten documentary films. I like that best. We've spoken now of the symphony, of the ballet, of the opera, 
of the film score. All of these you have made an impact in. Well, we have to also, I believe, talk about the more than 160 portraits you've composed. Oh, I think there are more than 200 by now. You've been working very hard then. Well, well I write them all the time. And uh, there are recent uh, publications. There's another batch ready for publication. Is my portrait, David Duval in Flights, going to be published? Yes. I hope to have a copy autographed. I would love to hear it right now also. Well, I can't play the piano anymore. But it's been orchestrated, and I have the recording. Well, you can play it on this hour. David Duval in Flight was something that I sat for. It's one minute long, about a year and a half ago, and I'm honored to be among the people you have painted in music. <laughs> From 1940 to 54, that means you were around 45 to 60 during those years of uh, yes. activity. How did you possibly manage to do all of the concerts uh, weekly, all of the conducting, the lectures, I'm sure, the constant composing? I don't know how you manage to do things, but if you're in the vein, you do them. The uh, age of 45 to 60... Those are likely to be very busy years in anybody's life, very productive. Especially for people who keep developing. Many people well, don't... Well, any professional is in full working power at that time. Now, after that, when you, uh, from 60 to 87, you haven't stopped a minute either. No, I still write a few books and quite a lot of music. Did you ever feel that writing which is obviously something very natural to you, ever got in the way of your other work? Did you ever despise the fact you had this other ability? Oh, no, no, no. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. Mm -hmm. no, I, nobody ever obliged me to do anything after I got grown up. Yes. A and one of the advantages of being young, energetic, and poor is you don't have to do anything you don't want to. The rich have to keep rich, or they have to get busy spending their money, or go places. But you could do when what you're you wanted. Poor, you, can, you can do what you like, you can stay where you are, and Bert, you can still read books and, and write them. You've never been poor, at least in the last 30, 40 years. But you have always survived, and yet you never went into any institutionalized teaching like most composers. You once called teaching the taint of pedagogy? I've never liked institutional teaching very much. I've done a little bit of it. As I say, uh, I was a minor instructor at Harvard when I was young, and then in my middle or late years, I've sometimes uh, done a little stint as a visiting professor it's all right, but it's not my business. Private lessons, fine. Anybody likes a bright student. You can have fun telling them things you know. But uh, my most successful uh, pupil, of course, was Ned Roram. He worked for me as, uh, when he was quite young. He came here when he was 19, I think, just out of Juilliard. I had hired him as a 
musical secretary, a copyist. I had a lot of work with that kind. And uh, I partly paid him for his work by giving him orchestration lessons. I taught him the whole thing, but he was a good student. I was okay. I've got a couple of students in Boston these days whom I've taught to orchestrate and who I've taught the mysteries of the words and music game. Rodney Lister and uh, Scott Wheeler, they're both about 30. But their musical education, which was elaborate, seemed to have omitted both orchestration in any effective sense uh, and any serious approach to the words and music technique. So I gave it to them. I thought I, I thought they ought to know those things. It's very kind of you. Virgil Thompson, you were just honored. Kennedy Center Honors, it's called. Well, I just you saw get, you on you television. You get a sort of medal mm -hmm. uh, and a vast amount of entertainment and publicity, movie, uh, television, and so forth. But there's no money goes with it, just a lot of, lot of press. Well, you've always been adamant in getting paid something for what you do. Well, you don't get, you, you can't be adamant about somebody who wants to give you a medal. <laughs> well, especially when it's the President of the United States. I want to say that you looked wonderful on television with all of the other people. I think Fred Astaire was there and... Um, well, Frank Sinatra yes. was my uh, particular chum in that batch. I've always admired him in vocal technique. But I've admired him ever since he was a very young kid. There was a Catherine Dunham, a movie director named Kazan, an actor named Stewart. They're all very good people. All good people, all famous, all fairly old now and all deserving. Are you a political person? Have you ever been involved in any movements? You see, I'm again the government. I had two grandfathers and 13 great uncles in the Confederate Army. I'm an old rebel. Uh, I don't believe in governments, and I'm suspicious about everybody uh, operating in politics, left or right. But I was brought up in an atmosphere of democratic corruption in Kansas City, and uh, later thoroughly instructed uh, in Marxist uh, political philosophy of the Trotskyist persuasion by an old Harvard poet friend of mine, Sherry Mangan. Uh, so I know a great deal about the theory and even the practice of politics, uh, but I don't vote. I don't really greatly care or believe that votes change much. I like to have the privilege of voting and the privilege of not voting. You are, along with Otto Looning, I believe, an official Kentucky colonel. Did you ever have any aspirations to become the real thing, a president, a governor, a political force? Oh, no, I don't want to run anything. Uh, I like to tell people how to run things, but I don't want to have to go to an office and do it. Yes. Well, I thought, though, the idea of telling people how to do it would be fascinating. That's why the governor of New York State well, would be actually, great. Well, actually, it's uh, my uh, long association with my own generation and younger generations in music. I've been something of a, what the French would call an eminence grise uh, in that whole business. You're a very candy. I haven't invented anything. Uh, well, yes, maybe I have. I haven't created the career of Philip Glass, but as he pointed out to me, I was doing minimalist music 50 years before he did. Yes, he did point that out to me once about you. Yes. We were speaking before of the mother of us all. I also pointed out to him as a joke that uh, he'd had considerable success writing <laughs> operas in Sanskrit, and I've done perfectly well writing <laughs> operas in Gertrude Stein. Speaking of uh, writing music in Gertrude Stein, once we were talking about uh, Susan B. Anthony, the heroine of Mother of Us All, and then we talked about the complication of a woman trying to be both man and woman, and you said that it was Gertrude Stein who could, who could have that privilege both ways because of the power of well, her Well, a great many of being. those domineering and powerful Victorian ladies 
demanded and got the rights of a man and the privileges of a woman. They wanted it both ways, and they could make it work. If you're strong, you can. There's still a little bit to be done, I understand, uh, in getting equal wages for women as there is for blacks or uh, Spanish-speaking people. Well, we will talk just briefly about this century's music production. Although you don't like to make predictions, do you feel that some of Stravinsky will survive? Well, he's been dead now for 10 years or something, and I understand his royalties for musical performance amount to around a million dollars a year, and this doesn't include the, those extremely successful early works which were not copyrighted in the Western countries. That is amazing. What about your compatriot Aaron Copeland, who hasn't composed much in the last 15, 18 years? Will there be a body of his music that survives? Well, well I don't know. It's still, it's, it's still popular. Who is the most exportable American composer? Gershwin. Even with only four works? Five works? Yeah. You knew him only slightly? I knew him a bit, yeah. People still talk about your reviews. They still uh, read what you thought of Heifetz and Horowitz, and your influence was amazing. Were you surprised at your own power as a music critic in the 40s? I don't know. Do you miss you, your own... You try not to be the victim of uh, your power or influence because uh, you don't want to start throwing your weight and then become a, a kind of irresponsible and over-ambitious to be a kingmaker and things like that. That's not serious musicianship. I think music reviewing should be a serious musical job. John Cage wrote of Virgil Thompson that his position in relation to the art of music is that of an independent mystic in relation to established religion. What do you think of that phrase? It's all right by me. I don't want to be considered to be... a leader or even a part of the establishment, which I think is a slightly dirty word. Yes. Well, you've always lived a bohemian life, if I can use that word. Well, kind of bohemian. I take baths. Hmm. I still wear shirts and ties when I go out socially, so to speak. And you still have that wonderful smile, which sometimes is sly, sometimes a little diabolical, and sometimes mischievous, but very many times warm. Virgil, oh, well, that's, that's personal. That has nothing to do with your, your <laughs> professional situation. Do you still, with your bad ear, practice the piano a little? Doesn't do any good. If I play the piano, what my fingers do has no relation to what I hear. The uh, communication of musical sound is very, very inaccurate. Some things are merely flat, some sounds will give me a, a resultant tone uh, or one of the harmonic overtones. And uh, the mixture of those things uh, makes for a messy noise. I can still uh, hear fairly correctly the upper wind instruments or trumpets and singing. An orchestral sound it has so many interferences in it. It sounds to me very much like a football crowd going, ah, no discernible pitch or harmonic pattern. This is in no way, though, disturbed your creative process, your inner hearing. Well, my creative process is carried out without uh, benefit of test. I do it all out of the head and the memory of sound. I can show somebody how a piece goes, you know, the phrases and tempos and things like that, but I do not experience correctly the intervallic phenomenon or the harmonic phenomenon, that whole experience which makes shivers run up and down your spine. That comes, of course, mainly from the harmonic uh, phenomenon anyway, and that I, I no longer experience. I'm sorry about that because I enjoyed it.
although you did it frequently, were you a good conductor in your opinion? Oh, I could get to a concert. I was not a, anything uh, comparable to these people that have spent their entire life at it, who, without having to think about it at all, produce a musical sound out of an orchestra. Ormandy and Stokowski could do that. Oh, sure, Beecham could do it, too. You liked Beecham enormously, didn't you? Yes. He had musical sound. And you must have had wonderful conversations with him. Oh, that we did. We told each other funny stories and asked each other questions about music. You've known so many people. We discussed Gertrude Stein. What has happened to her place in American literature? Is it secure? Is it... The easy-to-read works are still read in paperback. The Yale Press has just put out a new book, I think, a sort of Gertrude Stein reader. They published, of course, eight volumes of her unpublished works after she died. Alice Toklas sold the Picasso drawings to pay for that. Uh, Gertrude's celebrity is still great. She was a natural for celebrity. Mm -hmm. She's been dead now for nearly 40 years, and anything about her is still capable of making the front page of the New York Times. Now, the front page is not ordinarily made by dead people, unless their death is the item. She makes the front page as though she was just living. Some people have that energy, that posthumous energy. Yeah. Very few. Do you ever look back in nostalgia? Do you say, oh, those those exciting first years at the Tribune or those first years in Paris, or do you just always live in the day? Well, you can look back with nostalgia to almost anything. I've always had a certain nostalgia about very uncomfortable situations, like in World War I, dust storms in western Oklahoma living in tents and a temperature of 10 below zero, you could not be more uncomfortable. Uh, that brought out the energy of liveliness in everybody, and you always remembered it. But as a general rule, you're not a sentimental man either. Well, I don't know whether I am or not. I have sentiments like anybody else. Virgil, when you wrote your autobiography, Virgil Thompson by Virgil Thompson? Yes. That was in 67, I believe, or so, that it was published. Came out in 66, if I'm not mistaken. So many things have happened to you. Did you ever feel that you wanted to add a chapter or two or four? I don't want to do, start writing my life again. Virgil, have you ever felt that you missed anything? For instance, maybe once you wanted to be a doctor, or a bullfighter, or a singer. When you're young, you want to be all sorts of things. Eventually, you settle for what you get. American composer and critic Virgil Thompson. Pianist and musical director David DeBall spoke with Thompson at the composer's home in the historic 101-year-old Hotel Chelsea in New York.